Um, several of you have signed up to give a brief elevator pitch style presentation. Um, I ask Sven Bulteheis to come to this stage. Sven, welcome. You have three minutes. Okay, I will have to hurry. <laughs> so, um, hello everyone. Uh, don't be scared by the title of my talk. I will keep it quite easy and high level. So, um, I would like to talk to you about geoprotective drug development. Geoprotective drugs, for those who don't know, that's basically drugs that slow down the aging process. And so, uh, when you try to develop a new drug, you start out with a lot of different compounds, ten thousands to hundreds of thousands of compounds. And the goal is to push them through a funnel that ends with a single drug that eventually gets on the market and helps people. And to do that, you have a lot of different filters. Moments where the number of compounds get reduced. And so the question is, what filters are we going to use to come up with drugs that work against aging? So classically speaking, and there are more than two methods, but two big methods are these, the target-based and the phenotypic-based. Phenotypic-based are the old way of doing it, dating back over 100 years of, uh, a, uh, of time. So it, in a phenotypic approach, you start with an organism, like a mice, you develop a model of the disease. So, for example, you have a mice, you infect it with a pathogen against which you want to do a cure, or you create a cancer model, and then you give that mice a bunch of different compounds until you find one that has the desired effect, and that is then uh, pushed through, eventually, hopefully, to the human. In the target-based one, you start with a target, a protein, typically. Uh, and then you are going to look for compounds that modulate the activity of that protein. Um, so um, then eventually you again push it through, uh, hopefully to a human drug. Now both have pros and cons associated with it. So here of course uh, a problem is that if this is wrong, if your target is wrong, it won't work. It won't do anything. Another thing is this is a highly artificial situation. You are looking at a protein in a test tube. Um, and obviously, for example, if you take a protein, you throw sulfuric acid in it, it will also stop functioning, but sulfuric acid is not a drug for any human illness. In here, you also have uh, pros and cons. Um, one of the uh, problems is, of course, a, a big animal like mice, uh, it's uh, a lot less throughput than uh, using a target based. Here you can screen tens of thousands to hundreds of thousands of compounds. That's difficult. I mean, nobody is having 100,000 mice uh, available. So uh, a solution for that problem is to use a simpler organism. And the simpler organism is the worm. Uh, it's about one millimeter in length. So this is huge in scale blow up. Uh, and the benefit of that is you can actually grow it in these plates. They are about this size. They contain 96 of these wells. And in each of these wells, you can put some of these worms and a different compound. And so in one plate, you can already test almost 100 drugs. And this is amendable to automation, which, of course, you can do with, say, a mice. And so um, I wrote a paper on that. Um, and that's basically my presentation. And I do recommend that once we have one of these drugs, you immediately buy 300 years of supply. Thank you. Thank you very much. Could I ask Boris Robel to come to the stage? All right, so uh, I'm going to present uh, essentially a startup uh, that we, we started in the Netherlands uh, last year, uh, European Institute for Brain Research, and uh, our idea is to preserve whole human brains at ultra-structural level, and you should care about it, because if you care about whole brain emulation, I believe that this is the way to go, probably uh, in order to do a whole brain emulation of a human brain, uh, the methods will be probably destructive, so you need it needs to be, uh, there needs to be a method to, to preserve an entire organ 
at a level of individual, that is, at a resolution of individual neurons and individual synapses and, and substructures in, in each neuron. And uh, there's no method that has been validated so far, and happy to discuss it uh, with you. If you sign up for any, well, cryonics or whatever, then I'm happy to discuss it why I believe it does not work currently. And this is something that we want to do in order for it to work. Uh, and please uh, hit me up also uh, if you are uh, at a later time, if you if you want to discuss it uh, and you don't find time to discuss it during this meeting. I can go to the next one. All right, so, so what do we do is, is we have, um, so, and why are we in the Netherlands? Um, I believe that any method of preservation needs to work in a way that is scheduled. So, so if one currently, the, way, the only way that I believe the, the human brain can be preserved at this level is if, uh, if a donor of the brain is, is a euthanasia patient. So it has to be a scheduled procedure because it's a very short window in which the brain can be perfectly, pres perfectly preserved. So, so in order to do that, we have a mobile unit and the idea is that we can, uh, that we can profuse um, a, a human donor in a, essentially like an ambulance in the field. So, so we already have started to obtain our first human brains. This is a piece of a brain from a, a human brain from a visual cortex. Uh, it's not quite visible here, but there's a stripe here of uh, myelinated, myelinated accents um, uh, for, that go from the thalamus to the, to the visual cortex. So it is indeed the visual cortex as, as a sample from this area of a human brain. All right, and if you are if you'd like to discuss it, uh, how we work, or, or help us, uh, we are essentially building a team right now. So, so if you are interested in, in research, either wet uh, type of research, actually going and doing in the field, do the human brain banking in the field. If you're a neuroscientist or biologist, um, that's obviously a help, but there's plenty of things that we can, we can teach. There's, it's not that complicated, actually. Uh, social social research, um, so, so how to actually make, um, uh, there's this various um, social type of bottlenecks here and challenges, also legal, so from, from that standpoint speakers of Dutch, uh, French or Spanish are of interest because these are the jurisdictions now in Europe in which this can work. Portugal is actually the next country in which uh, euthanasia has been, um, has been legalized. So that's potentially an option, but there's a very small number of cases. Uh, public relations, so, so if you can help us uh, with, with any of that, that obviously uh, would, be, uh, uh, would be also uh, a great boost. And also fundraising, obviously this, uh, this requires uh, a lot of money. We do have a funding from, from private donors already secured, uh, but there's not enough. <laughs> it's also like thinking long term, there's, there's always um, a need to diversify the funding sources so that uh, this type of research can be, uh, can be funded in a stable way. And if you have any questions, uh, just talk to me during lunch. Uh, if you would like to discuss it, uh, please take um, um, you know, note my email and you can contact me afterwards. Could I next ask Peter Bethen to come to the stage? <coughs> so, um, well, I feel a bit like a stranger amidst of uh, all these uh, very intelligent and it's not on. Okay, uh, all these intelligent and brilliant uh, transhumanists. Uh, so yesterday I was still looking for the connection, uh, as I was also for the first time uh, really confronted with. Uh, the uh, term of uh, transhumanism, uh, but I think I found a link more or less. I'm a teaching professor uh, at uh, the section strategy and international business at the uh, Amsterdam Business School, um, dealing of course with the new generation um, uh, master students and also bachelors, you know, um, and of course I see what they are doing these days and that is also <coughs> more or less related oh sorry more or less uh, related what we have been discussing here 
Um, but I'm also a PhD researcher, and that's maybe where we can make a link between uh, what transhumanism uh, means and what I'm doing as a researcher. I'm uh, researching specifically on uh, knowledge management for the last 10 years, uh, specifically also the connection with AI. And in the context of uh, high reliability organizations, so my uh, search, my, um, I would say, attempt uh, for the last uh, 10 years is to get access, more access to what we call, of course, uh, that enormous tacit knowledge uh, and how that can be more or less uh, integrated uh, in order to deal with the challenges of today. And specifically, of course, I'm dealing with um, so I cannot offer you a startup or whatsoever, but the fact is that um, uh, we are now uh, doing research specifically on how high reliability organizations like nuclear plants, but also uh, pharmaceutical companies, uh, hospitals, how we can help them specifically in getting more access to what we call the tacit or implicit knowledge and uh, how to bring it in in order to deal with the complexity um, where I also learned today and also yesterday with the aging clocks uh, that that uh, type of knowledge is also of course specifically wanted. So uh, I would leave it uh, to that. So if you have any ideas or questions related to uh, high reliability organizations and how they work Please feel free during the lunch. I will be there. Thank you. Thanks very much, Peter. Could I next ask Venta Patel to come to the stage? Um, so this is my website, which I recently launched last year. And this presentation is also very spontaneous. I just decided to do it this morning. Uh, it's called symbioticfutures.org. And my background is in philosophy, and my research interest is in well, symbiosis, evolution, post-humanism. So I am not a transhumanist, but I am very interested in transhuman ideas of the future, and um, which is why I have this um, website where I want to basically create a community where we discuss what are our ideas about the future, but especially uh, with a focus on symbiosis, uh, thinking about other, our relations to other creatures, including bacteria, virus, like animals. Um, so I'm very interested about futures, but also in relation to other creatures on this planet. So I come with that approach. And um, so I want, I want to, how do I scroll down? So I want to, uh, so I have some book reviews, and I also uh, write uh, poems, and I welcome uh, also other people to submit essays or poems or art, so it's multidisciplinary. Here are some themes uh, that are on the website, so it's futures, philosophy, posthumanism, transhumanism, space, etc. I'm also very much inspired by Lynn Margulis, who is a biologist, who came up with the theory of um, basically the way we evolve. We have we evolve not just in competition, but we evolve because we through cooperation. So she looks specifically at bacteria, and that really uh, I think was very eye-opening for me uh, to think about how we cannot move forward, we cannot progress without thinking about how we function with other creatures. We cannot live without other creatures. And so if we're going to think about different ideas of progress, we cannot not think about you know, creatures like bacteria that we really rely on to, uh, to be alive. Um, so to put very simply, yeah, Symbiotic Futures is about realizing our relationships to other species inspired by post-humanism. 
So it's multidisciplinary and we feature multimedia content, art, essays, stories, blogs, videos, interviews, and podcasts. And so the aim is to create an intellectual and creative and artistic community, passionate about non-human forms and also human forms of life and our relation to them and how it will shape uh, futures with an S. Um, so if you have any ideas, send me a pitch. Uh, I can share my email with you, uh, maybe during lunch. And yeah, that's it. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much. I will just take this off of uh, full screen mode for one second so you get the URL, symbioticfutures.org. Uh, I'm, I'm really old school. I, I'm subscribed to like 100 newsletters. Mm -hmm. And I think it would be really cool if a new book review or so comes up that I get a notification of that in my mailbox, and then I can I can dive in there. That's just something pops into my head. Yeah. Uh, we have one more uh, lightning talk. Could I ask Humber von Stralen to come to the stage? Um, so okay, hi everyone. Is this? Can you hear this? Um, so I thought we could do a little interactive thing, which is partially inspired by the first two speakers of the night. Because the first speaker said, well, you know, there are all these things which transhumanists are being confused with. So, and the second speaker said, well, this is a bunch of things which are so closely related that, you know, are we basically this or not? So it just raises the question, what is transhumanism in a way? And I thought, well, we could do an interactive thing. So what this QR code will do is it will take you to a quiz um, with a bunch of questions like, does it work? Is it working? Put it down a tiny bit. Okay. Um, with a bunch of questions on, you know, like what you think. This is not about me at all. Uh, I should perhaps say a tiny bit about myself. <laughs> so my name is Humber, and I'm teaching uh, philosophy in the Erasmus University, and I'm mostly busy reading about animals, which you know is not particularly humanistic, I guess. Um, <laughs> But this is a bunch of questions, and I thought like we could go through them really quickly, and then check out the results together. And this is always really fun to do with any group of people, so it might be a nice end to it. Um, yeah, can I scroll or can I tap? Um, down keys. Okay. Question number one: Am I a transhumanist? Which is interesting, right? Because not everyone here is. Okay. So question number one. Yes, no, maybe. Second question, diet, stuff you eat, which was mentioned in the first talk as well. Um, four options, carnivore, pescatarian, vegan, vegetarian. What do you eat? Perhaps carnivore should also say omnivore because you know, you're going to eat, ed you're also probably going to eat vegetables. Um, okay, but some of you might be vegan, some not, which I think it would really interest me to hear, hear about. Um, how do you rate this location? Because I was just walking out and I really like this location a lot. <laughs> like, really, really a lot. So, on a scale of 1 to 10, what do you think? Next question. Um, abolish gender. You get only get two options, yes or no. <laughs> no, no third option. Um, ironically, perhaps. Um, okay. This is a yeah, something which bothered me a bit when reading uh, Nick Bostrom's text. So, does high culture exist as something different from low? If you've been dealing with teenagers, I mean, just try to convince them that Mozart is better than little Kleine. You, you, cannot, you cannot do it. So, does high culture exist versus low culture? Um, next is a list, which I think is generally interesting. Have you seen these movies? And this is sort of bleeding into the stereotype, of course. So, Mean Girls, Bambi, An Inconvenient Truth, Jurassic Park, any of the like six, seven of them, The Green Mile, Lord of the Rings, any of them, including, uh, yeah, sorry, one minute, yeah. Um, well, you can go through them on your phone. Um, next question, are human beings animals? And you can rate them from a scale to one to six. <laughs> um, cats or dogs. <laughs> dogs, cats, neither, both. Um, humanity is in existential risk. Perhaps some of you would say no. And some of you will say yes. Sleep is wrong. Yes, no. 
animal testing acceptable, non-acceptable? Interplanetary colonization, we trust the stereotype. Again, yes or no, no middle way. Aging is a disease. I will skip this one, by the way. Um, everything will be all right. You might know the reference, but not everyone knows the reference. Everything will be all right. Yes or no. So this inspired by the hope talk a few seconds ago. And one aphorism of wisdom. And since I'm out of time, you can check the results yourself after you hand it in. So they will just bleed in, and you can check what other people have been saying. Because I don't think I have any time left, right? Uh, it's time is up now. Yeah, exactly. But could you put the um, thing back up there? The QR code. Yeah. Smaller. Smaller. Yeah. Smaller. Yes. Oh, okay. Um, so I guess we can discuss the the, the results over dinner. <laughs> we'll see. Here. Thanks very much. I want to play. It's. Uh... Okay. Um, so thank you for giving me the opportunity to present my uh, my uh, project. So the project um, is called Enhance Intelligence and Renew Morality, uh, Forging an Ethical Transhumanist Future. So um, um, we have a few problematics today. Um, we are talking a, a lot about um, the future and what we can do with the technologies and what we can improve. Uh, but I think we still have uh, some um, deep issues in how we function as a human community. So just a disclaimer, I'm, I'm an agnostic, so the only thing I know is that I don't know. Um, and God gave 10 commandments 3,000 years ago, so it was quite a long time. Um, the first one is, you shall not kill. And um, the question is, is Israel and Palestine, it's, it's, uh, uh, I, I don't have the answer, but is Israel and Palestine closest to God following this uh, very simple commandment today? So you can answer this. Um, there are a lot of um, answers to, to this. Some people will say it depends. So it's basically 10 commandments. The commandment said you shall not kill, but with some exceptions. But God didn't say with some exceptions. He said, you should not kill. So <clears throat> the, the other question is, um, how come God is not enough to enforce such a simple commandment after 3,000 years? Uh, and the, the last one as a problematic is, how do we continue to empower the Homo sapiens sapiens while removing the major threats to humanity well-being? So, I think we have everything to make the world a better, a better place. We have timeless moral prin principles uh, derived from various uh, wisdom, traditions, and philosophies. Um, I'm not saying they are all good, but they are simply available, like the Ten Commandments. They are pretty easy. Um, we have key concepts like uh, compassion, truth truthfulness, respect for life, and they are found across uh, various cultures and religions. But we are still unable to apply in the real world um, all this, despite all agreeing they are great. Like we, I think we all agree with uh, you should not kill. But this is not what, what's happening. So, thank you. So I think my project is to bridge human wisdom and AI. So I started this um, initiative a few months ago. Uh, and I put it simply, it's a project dedicated to the in-depth study of sacred texts and various philosophies as to create a better society. So we seek to extract universal moral principles appropriate to our times and live uh, based on them accordingly. So example, do we all agree on following you shall not kill as a basis, basis to a better world? Um, and missing bricks, I think, that I have found recently uh, that are really encompassing these values um, are love your neighbors as you love yourself and truly forgive as we are all sinners. I'm agnostic, I'm not, uh, but you understand what is a sinner. Uh, so, and I think AI is central in this project as it is more and more powerful to analyze vast amounts of philosophical and religious texts, offering insights into complex moral questions and way more in the future.
Um, so if this is something that resonates, uh, we are welcoming contributions, uh, while being very picky to, to the core contributions. Uh, so if you wish for a better society from its roots, not super fashion better, like uh, we are uh, living longer. Um, if you want to participate with the best intentions, uh, we believe bringing, it's, a, it's kind of thought-provoking, we, we believe we are bringing heaven on earth. Uh, and it's possible, it starts today, and it's one of the most important work to do. Um, and science, just a quote, science without conscience is only ruin of the soul. So, last questions for, for you. It's uh, what is heaven, if you think rationally and scientifically? Um, what is hell? And uh, what is the human transformation when we go to heaven of our uh, Are we still us, or do we have to transform? If we are sinners and we go to heaven, what, what do we bring to heaven? And uh, can we bring heaven to earth? And uh, the last thing is a mathematical formula, which is uh, the limit of human plus AI. I think with enough time, uh, we will reach God. We will be God. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks very much indeed. Um, I think this is the first time I've seen a mathematical definition of God, so that's, that's quite interesting. Um, thank you all for your contributions.